ago, uh, actually two months ago, and then we really worked on it post Christmas, is figuring out how to put together a panel that hasn't been done at a VC type conference. And I think I figured it out. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Greg Bettinelli. I'm a partner here at Upfront Ventures. Uh, this is my second go around, our second event here. I've been a partner a little over a year now. Um, and this panel could be a little bit of a hedge in case I really stink at being a VC. Uh, but with LPs in the room, I probably shouldn't say that. Uh, but it's a tough crowd. It's uh, <laughs> and so I did a little worse research. There's about 56 current operators in and around the technology world that we play in uh, that over the past five years have gone from the VC world to the operating world. Um, of that list, there are four to five who actually were partners or senior people at firms, and we have that entire group here. So I'm excited about putting the group together. Um, you know, a couple of people flew in today and last night. We have Richard here from, the, from, the, from LA and three people from Valley, but I'll do a little intro. And usually we don't like to do longer intros, but I thought it'd be a little bit more to give a little insight on your backgrounds because you all have very distinct backgrounds, and I think that tells part of the story. And then we'll dig in kind of one-on-one -on -one as a group to kind of dig down on you know, what it's like to be on the other, other side of the table. Um, a story about how VCs become operators. So Amy, if you could start, that would be great. Sure, um, my name's Amy Arrett. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Madison Reed. Uh, I started Madison Reed in May of 2013, uh, my fourth company. So I don't, uh, maybe a little bit different, three companies, then I was a VC, then I started Madison Reed. Uh, for five years, I was a GP at Mavron and opened the Bay Area office uh, and then left there to do Madison Reed. Uh, my name is Mark Bodnick. I am the uh, senior business exec at Quora. Uh, I've been at Quora about four years. Uh, previously, uh, I was a co-founder, uh, managing director at Elevation Partners, uh, where I was probably most active on our uh, Facebook and Yelp investments. And then previously, I uh, kind of grew up, I'm really more of a a growth and private equity investor than venture. I was at Silver Lake uh, and then uh, Blackstone before that. And you were for 16 years, you were on the investing side, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Ish. Uh, yeah. LinkedIn, I, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, 15 years from the time uh, I, I, I was a, a year at Blackstone when I was young, and then I went back to Blackstone in the mid 90s and then straight through until I left for Quora. Gosh. Uh, Raj Kapoor. So started out uh, in the internet industry at, at, at home and then excited home doing e-commerce. Then started Snapfish. I was the CEO and the co-founder of that. Uh, sold it twice. First time not so great. Second time worked out better uh, in 2005. And then for seven years I was a managing director at Mayfield Fund. Did about 14 investments there. And then uh, decided I was going to be a co-founder to multiple companies. And I was told that the biggest failure mode is to fall in love with one, which I did within three months and uh, became CEO and co-founder of FitMob. Uh, I'm Richard Walpert. I started my career in computer science here at UCLA. Uh, 1984, moved to Cupertino, joined Apple as part of the Mac development team, which was an awesome first job. Um, left there after two years, did my first startup, which was called After Hours Software, consumer software for the Mac, which I sold to Adobe in 1993 and spent two years with them. Then I was on the founding team at Disney Online, so I spent three years at Disney, which was enough for me, and uh, helped them grow their internet group. Uh, then did another startup called Audio Mill that had a TiVo for internet, -like, uh, internet radio-like product that I sold to Real Networks in 2001. Spent six years there as the chief strategy officer. Sort of accidentally got into venture in 2007, uh, became a venture partner with Excel Partners, uh, started doing angel deals. I've done over 50 angel deals, uh, just my own capital, and was also one of the founders of Amplify LA. Uh, about a year ago, got the itch again to do a startup, uh, which we'll get to in a few minutes. It's called Hello Tech. It's going to disrupt the uh, tech support and new technology sales market, going after not just Geek Squad, but also Best Buy. Um, and up front's one of our investors. So, so yes, and obviously, great panel. 35 years of invest, 36 if you add me with investing experience up here. Uh, there we go. Uh, uh, so let's talk about Trigger. I think Richard, you will work around that way. You talked about the Trigger. You were an investor, you know, working with a cell and others for eight years, and then yeah. you get that itch. Yeah. Like, is it an itch that came on year seven, day 364? 
that had come on year two, year four. Like, tell, tell us about that story. And I'll ask that. I think this is one of the few questions we'll ask to everybody. But I think everyone else knows, is the itch, was it a long itch, was it a short itch? Let's talk about that itch. Yeah, so it sounds like I'm not going to answer your question at first, but I will, Greg, I promise. Appreciate so that. Um, for me, going just to tell a little story, it's all about where's your soul and where's your soul most passionate? And when I was 12 years old, I lived over by the Grove, and there was a market there called Market Basket, and you could return carts through a little turnstile and get a coupon. And if you got 50 coupons, then you could get a dollar's worth of food. And I spent my weekends collecting these coupon books, but didn't want to buy food, so I would sell them for 80 cents on the dollar to customers who were going into the market looking to buy food, and was able to make you know, five, $10 a day, which back in the mid-70s actually wasn't that bad. Um, and that's sort of where my soul is. It's in ideas like that. When I was at Apple, I helped start the first programming class for the Macintosh, which is obviously still a class that they're teaching today. Um, for me, it was about a year ago. And uh, uh, to answer your question specifically, it was never really gone, sort of the pilot light's always there. Um, but after being in venture for about seven years, I started feeling like I was jealous of the people that I was helping out, that it looked like they were having more fun than I was. And that was when I really started to think, I, I, I want to get back into it. You really, you got like three weeks vacation at any time you wanted. You really think you were having, they were having more fun than you? Um, no, no, no. It was just the... At one time, three weeks. Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, it's, you know, building a team, building a culture, figuring out a market, um, having successes, having difficulties, uh, growing something. That, that was really where my passion is. And I've enjoyed being a venture investor, and I've, I've done fine at it, but it really is not in my soul, right? I wasn't the kid in the parking lot looking to fund the other kid that was returning shopping carts. I was actually doing the carts myself, so. Raj? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting because I thought about this, is, is it that I'm leaving venture and becoming an operator, and I'm all, my soul is an operator, and I'm not sure I'm still there yet on that. I think it's gonna, my life is probably going to be a pendulum where... You know, one decade is about operating, another decade is about venture, because I did enjoy it. But similar, though, I found in, during those, especially the tail end of those seven years, that I was most excited about going to my companies and sitting down with the CEO and being like, what's going on? And how can we solve? What's your problem? Let's go out and do that. And wasn't as excited, especially after seven years and about 400 meetings a year, of meeting the nth company and smiling through a presentation. So is it, let me is the dig in, is it the mechanics of being an investor? I Meaning a lot of people don't know, there's a lot of, it's a business in itself, there's a partnership. Most people have very different points of view at very different times. We go through fundraising processes. Was it the business of venture or the actual being part of venture that you think caused you to almost see relief in going to work with the companies that you were working? Now, I don't think it's necessarily something structurally wrong okay. in my perspective, from my perspective with venture. It's just that it is just a fundamentally different phase that you're working. It's like a different phase than being an entrepreneur. You are, the, you are moving at a different pace uh, that's there. You're basically whale hunting. It's about the two big deals that you do versus that operating high that you get on a daily basis and the operating low that you get on a daily basis. And the team issues that you have in a company are kind of interesting, fun, and about leadership, whereas the team issues you have in a partnership are not that fun. <laughs> Mark? Um, so for me, I, I had been in the investing business for you know, most of my life, or just about all my professional life. And um, by the end of my investing experience, I sort of came to this view, which a lot of people have, uh, which is that uh, you spend all this time looking at investments uh, when you're in tech investing, and it turns out only a handful of them really matter. Uh, and diversification is sort of overrated. Um, and so despite years and years and years of doing work and taking meetings, it turns out that all of the, the, the little time and energy that I had put into our Facebook and Yelp investments was all, the, all that really mattered in my career. And so um, I had been a huge uh, Facebook user like probably one of the heaviest users of the product over 30, 35 uh, in 2007, 2008. And, um, and I knew Adam and Charlie uh, personally, uh, the, guy, the f founders of Quora, and uh, I was a very early user of Quora. Like I was the 157th beta user. 
And I just fell in love with the product and I shifted uh, my time from being like 40 or 50 hours a week on Facebook to... And was Elevation an investor or it was just more... Elevation was an investor in Facebook, right. but not in, okay. not in Quora. And um, so I started spending 30 or 40 hours a week on Quora. You know, I'd be sitting on conference calls and I was never the person that was going to like execute the documentation <laughs> that was being discussed at length. Uh, but I would listen... Uh, and then I would be on Quora. And I, I finally just concluded that I really felt like this company was super important uh, and that I hadn't come across a company like this. And so rather than spend you know, my life trying to get into the C round and the G round and whatever, the Goldman round later on, uh, that I would just join uh, full time, which was a huge you know, diversification decision. Have you written a Quora post about why you switched? Uh, yeah, I think like the first day I joined, the day I was announced, I wrote it. I wrote it. It was it was a dicey decision because I'm not a natural operator. I'm not super systematic or patient. So uh, <laughs> I remember meeting Mark in 2006, spending a lot of time on a couple of deals that never actually happened, if I remember correctly. Story of private equity. <laughs> Uh, Amy, I think, and then I'll follow up with you because I have a sure. couple of questions specific for you yeah. as well. So uh, a lot of these gentlemen have said some of the similar things that I felt. Um, from the beginning of being an investor, I found myself apologizing to my friends that were CEOs. Um, it, literally, I would start, they'd say, wow, it must be really exciting. And I'd go through this whole excuse thing. Uh, and so I never really felt like I was fully in my skin. And maybe that's the best description, which is um, you spend days and months and uh, years and you do one or two things. And the way that I describe that is if I was a CEO or a founder of a company, I should be fired for that. So for me, it's about the little things that you do as an operator, that every little thing matters, every move, every hire, every piece of your culture. And so that's more my skin. Um, I had the great, uh, Mavron's a great firm. I had the good fortune of opening an office for them. So that was entrepreneurial in its own way, uh, which really worked for me. Um, but it was very much my soul was sort of longing. I'd go to board meetings and I'd think, God, they're having all the fun, even in the bad moments. So it was, uh, it was really clear that I needed to get back and operate. Do you think people could read you? that that was what you were thinking, or did you? You mean because I was like gripping the table? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, um, maybe, I, I don't think so, because I felt like one of the things I was good at is working with entrepreneurs. The, the part that I really love, because I think for those of you in the room that are investors and for these gentlemen, it's, it's an honor to meet people every day that are putting their heart and soul into what they're doing. I mean, that's a big deal. And so for me, meeting those people and learning through that process was an honor. So did you know, when you went to Mavron, did you have any intention of ever becoming an entrepreneur again? Yeah, I think, uh, I think I, it sort of came to me through my experience with okay. Mavron, but I didn't seek out being a VC. Okay. And then it was working for me for a number of years, but I think in the back of my mind, I always felt like there was, I was going to get back to that chapter again. Very dicey. I, I, I Whenever definitely, you, oh, I'm sorry. I definitely knew when I got into venture that that wasn't my 20-year horizon. Um, it was, and I joke with friends sometimes, things that are painful, you need some time to pass so you forget the memories, and then you can go back in. Women talk about that with childbirth. Um, I think birthing a new company is a little bit similar, so it was good to get some time between starts. Uh, but for me, I, I assumed at the right time, I would step back in as an operator. I was going to say, bringing, an bringing a great operator into an investment organization is a, uh, is a wild ride. I mean, unless they're really decided they want to spend the rest of their career investing, in my experience. Because, you know, if you've run a big business and now you're at a 20-person investment organization, uh, people frequently get the itch to go back. Like, Raj, that fits your... I would, that, I would say one, you know, not that I want to interject too much, is the one thing I miss in a very short period of time is the daily scorecard. Like I would, I could tell you exactly it was delivered at 12.02. I wouldn't go to sleep until that scorecard was delivered. Um, and that's the one thing that to me feels very different. And I know Raj, you came from the operating side as well. Not being able to keep score on a daily basis, was that a very different world for you? 
Yeah, it, it, it bas it's also a lot more lonely, I think. Even though there is a partnership, at the end of the day, it's like the wolf pack and you're out there. You've got to go hunt and bring back the food, throw it on the table, and everyone looks and sees, is that food really delicious or not? But it takes about two years to figure out whether it tastes good. So um, it is, it's definitely it's, it's a combination of those elements around the, te the teamwork that you really miss uh, that's out there and those kind of daily rushes that you have in doing it. But I will say that the grass is always greener on the other side. There are certainly days where I'm sitting here going, oh, shit, man, I wish I was back into being a VC and chilling out and you know, didn't have to have that daily low and the daily high all the right. time uh, in doing it. So nothing is perfect. It's not, I don't think I can say 100% this is just the only, the, the most amazing experience in the world, and that was 100% the most amazing experience at the time. It's just different trade-offs. So are there things, and I'll ask uh, Richard, and you can kind of lead it with this, what do you think has made you a better operator and entrepreneur with the experience you have as an investor? Yeah. Um, and then we'll go to the flip side as well. What things you probably don't do as well because you, you're jaded by having been on the other side of the table for so Yeah, long. I mean, so I, essentially I've done three startups, but uh, Amplify LA, which I'm a co-founder of, has funded 43 or 44 startups. Um, as I mentioned, I've invested in about 50 personally. Um, so I've just had a great window into what works, what doesn't, the importance of balanced teams, not all tech, not all business, the importance of balancing out ages, not everybody in their 20s, not everybody in their 40s. Um, so I've just had a great, great window into what has worked historically and sort of what's working most recently. And that's been, you know, we only started Hello Tech in November, so it's very early. We're in that honeymoon phase where we have no customers and nobody's complaining about anything, so it's great. Um, but I've had this great window that I can now apply to this business. Amy? Yeah, I think I'm a much better operator uh, because I was a VC. There's no question about that. I would say there's a couple of different things. I'd say that one of the things that happens when you're a VC is you get a window into a ton of things very quickly. And you really do, you can go very deep in some verticals. And, you know, Madison Reed is a, is a, com a consumer tech company. Um, and so one of the things was that I invested in a ton of consumer tech companies. And, sort of what I call the pattern recognition of the things that are most important when you're an investor are typically the things that are actually most important as the CEO, because you need to recruit a world-class team. You need to make sure that the size of the prize is big enough. You have to have a killer product. I mean, these are all things that are not different because you're uh, a operator versus an investor. I think I understand the rules of engagement differently. Right, I think I understand, it. I think it was very insightful for us to be able to select the investors we selected because we knew what experience they would need to have to be helpful around the table. So I, I, there's no question that it's, it's been a great uh, experience to know that. And Mark, are there things that you thought you knew and you learned as an investor that turned out to be dead wrong as you moved to the other side? Um, you know, I think that, uh, Investing wasn't super helpful uh, to mm -hmm. in the switch to operating. You know, like as an as an investor, at least for me, like managing people wasn't that important, and like building scalable things wasn't that important. I mean, like if you just made a couple of good decisions, uh, that scaled. Uh, but in a business, you have to build things that you know are repeatable and scale and work. Uh, relatively easily as things get three times bigger and three times bigger and 10 times bigger. So I had to kind of learn a lot uh, from scratch, uh, especially in my first couple of years. The one thing that was, that was useful from the old life was, you know, thinking about investors. But we'll talk about that later, but Raj, I know you have. Yeah, so it's interesting because I think there are two type of opportunities that exist in kind of the venture field and the tech field. There's, there's black swans and there's kind of execution plays. And I think it's actually very challenging for, and this is also a function perhaps of age or being an investor to come in and think that you're gonna make a black swan play happen. Because those are things that you're, it take, it's actually the inexperience helps you. Like what Mark stumbled upon with Facebook or all the examples with Twitter and everything else that's out there. Those are things that you just don't say, okay, this is going to work. I'm gonna create 150 character, 140 character messaging service and it's gonna be worth $25 billion. Um, I think that's where it could hinder you because the pattern recognition could be absolutely wrong in what you're doing and you think you know too much. 
Um, I think if, you, if your business is an execution play, or at least you figure it out and it becomes an execution play, then it really helps. Like all the things that you said about pattern recognition go in there. Networks are incredible, you know, in terms of like my network compared to the 20 something entrepreneur that's trying to create something, I'll crush him, you know, on doing that. But he will crush me when it comes to a black swan um, and being able to do that. So it really depends. And I think that's kind of a caution that I've learned myself, which is like, don't overthink that you're too smart to come up with the greatest idea. But I think I have an edge on execution. Something that's relevant to you specifically, you still serve on boards, right? Are you a better board member now as an operator and the experience you've had versus coming at it from purely the day-to-day -day side of the investor? Well, and I'll, you're I'll, on Lyft, right? Yeah, okay. and I'll, I'll comment on it. I mean, it's interesting because I think I was way too in their shoes and now I realize how much I was in their shoes um, of sitting on the other side and not wanting to have my investors too much in my shoes on doing that. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is actually being able to help with very specific issues because I have the pat a pattern recognition of experiencing that three months ago versus, yeah, seven years ago when I did Snapfish, we, you know, like, who cares? That I bought like a $7 million storage box then that's not relevant anymore. Richard, you, you saw a lot of companies. You're a personal investor and even more companies than investors are. Uh, were there other opportunities where you saw someone with a great idea or great business that you thought, wow, I really want to join this or be part of this versus going in and doing it all by yourself? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, I definitely, I decided about a year I wanted to get back into it. And what were those, if there's examples? What's that? If there are examples of those, we'd like to hear those. Too. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I spoke to all the usual suspects here in L.A., and it, it became quickly clear to me that that start from scratch, build a culture, was really where my heart was. And joining, maybe it's less risky to join sort of a Series A, Series B, Series C level company, um, it just wasn't going back to Seoul. I'm big on the Seoul. Um, it was not where my soul was. So for me, it was a pretty easy decision that I wanted to do something from scratch. Let's talk about, I think a lot of people have an interest, and I do, what's it like to raise money or go through the process of raising money from people who used to hang out you with at events like this? Did you, and I'll ask the three of you, because I think you were all involved in different levels, and Mark has done you know, large growth rounds and and Amy and Raj, you know, we're the Series A, Series B side now. I love the take on, did you go in knowing exactly who you wanted to go with? Did you offend people? Did you, you know, just kind of take us through that? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people who had great relationships with. Um, how did that process work out? Um, I knew exactly who the people that I would want to um, have as investors were. So it was, uh, the Series A was a pretty seamless process. Um, and Series B was a pretty seamless process, and I don't, I don't say that because uh, of, you know, I, I think that we're in a particularly frothy market, right? So I'm always, uh, you know, particularly humbled by the fact that, um, you know, there's lots of capital. Uh, but for me, it was I was really clear with who uh, would be a, a good fit for us, and so that hasn't been you know, particularly difficult. I think that um, when it comes, what was interesting is like when it comes to putting your deck together, you know, that's a very practical thing. And it's almost like what Raj says, you might know too much. Did you do the deck yourself? Uh, I actually did, which was highly problematic. How long had it been since you had done a deck? Uh, you know, I, a long time. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it was highly problematic, mm -hmm. right? Because part of what you you start doing is you start thinking, well, like, what were the decks that I really liked? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the truth of that is that you should put the deck together that best describes your business. And so I thought that that was kind of an interesting process. Um, and I think you, for me, you have a little bit of insight into things like, and, you know, for entrepreneurs in the room, you have insights into, um, you know, how big is a partnership and how long has the partner been there and where are they on the food chain? And uh, where, where is the partnership in the fund? And you know, do, do you want to be the last investment or those kinds of things? So I think I had a little bit of insight about the business part of it, which was helpful about making some of those other decisions. Mark, you've been involved in a lot of big transactions um, and investment. And I look at you as a, a, a very analytical, deal-driven, historical investor, and then getting to do core and growth rounds and other things, did you end up finding you felt feeling like more of a banker than as an entrepreneur, like, you know? 
Well, first of all, uh, Adam, who's our founder and CEO, really, he led. He, he led and drove all the rounds. So I've been a Quora through a B and C round and, and wasn't there for the A round. But uh, Adam uh, really was the person who drove it. What I would say in what I've seen, you know, in the last few years and then at the tail end of my time in investing is that it's definitely an environment where as an investor, you have to be pretty decisive. Like you can know an awful lot about a company without getting any inside private information. You know, is this company, is this product a good product or a bad product? Where does it sit in the world? And um, I think that uh, investors that succeed, at least kind of in the universe I'm in, are, are very decisive, fast, uh, have a clear view of, of the company uh, and product. And so uh, processes are, are pretty quick. One, one thing that affected my decision was I have tremendous amount of more respect for VCs. It's, in my opinion, a really hard job because it's not like you can pick, oh, I'm going to do digital media and close my eyes to everything else. You have to understand SaaS businesses and hardware businesses and digital media businesses and consumer direct businesses. And I just found that it, you know, it was intellectually stimulating but it's a tremendous amount of stuff that you have to be educated on. When you're operating a company, I feel like it's a lot more focused, where you're in a sector and it might have one or two branches out, but you can really, really focus and get deep. And for me, in some ways, I find that easier. So I really respect having done it, venture capitalists. Some people say it's an easy job. I think it's a tremendously difficult job. It's, it's easy. It's like being a general manager of a football team. It's really easy. It just, yeah. How hard is it? Uh, Raj, did you say no to people on the investment side? Did, did people say no to you? Um, Absolutely. Okay. Um, you How know, was that? Like, both sides of doing it. I think um, you know, that's the one thing you learn really well on the venture side, which is how to say no well and still remain friends. And that's a really good thing to continue on as an operator as well. And also how to take no. You know, when I was the first time doing it in my 20s, I took every no as like a knife in my stomach. And now I realized, yeah, there's a lot of dynamics there. And um, all I need is one investor, not 50 of them to say yes, um, to move ahead um, that I like. But I would say one comment on, you know, what's the difference in fundraising? It's also, you can just cut through the crap a lot easier. It's like, especially first, you have a relationship probably because you've co-invested or know this person from the network. Second is like, okay, I know what the, the two or three key things that you're really worried about or that you really have questions that are excited about. Let's talk about that versus all the other dog and pony stuff that you have to go through. Let's, let's shift a little bit to, I think, team, because I think that's a very interesting part, is that we sit in on this role, uh, we meet with hundreds of people each and every year, we sit in you know, dozens of board meetings a year. You really are a constant evaluator of talent. When you moved over, did you have a hit list of, I need to get these five people? Did you have some conflicts because they were actually affiliated with companies you had previous relationships with? Being out of the operating side for you know, five to 10 years, you become a little stale on one side. We'll we could talk about that, but two, just from a hiring, and how does that process help? Amy, I know that you be, have great examples for that. Yeah, um, so uh, I've had a combination of folks that I worked with before. I was out of operating for about five years, so it was long enough, but not super long. Uh, and then I think I had a greater appreciation of, again, in <coughs> what we needed in terms of skill base. So I had a greater network, as Raj said, to go deep into. What I've found is your network is the best place to start recruiting from. Um, and so that really led us to a number of people that we've been able to recruit. I also think that I always, uh, like Richard, had a passion for and a soul for creating a unique culture and especially a consumer facing brand. I think your culture actually internally reflects on how your customers feel about you externally. Um, and so I had more of appreciation of that not just being a theory, but that being a reality, and spent a lot of time initially working on that uh, with both exec team and as we've grown the company. But certainly an advantage to have the network around recruiting, no question. And Mark, in, in the world of investment, you know, in the firms that you worked with before, there's not a lot of turn. You know, you might get a couple new associates every couple years, maybe a partner terms every few years. 
What's it like now to be in an environment where there's new people every day, people are coming and going, just is that, what's that been like? Well, I was really bad at hiring uh, <laughs> early on. I mean, I had, I'd never done it. What somebody I read somewhere said is that y you eventually just need a lot of like s swings of the bat. Like you need to just hire people and, <clears throat> and see who's great and where you made your mistakes. And I had no experience really, because you're right, in private equity and at Elevation, you know, we hired an dozen people or something. So uh, it took me a long time. I also had no, uh, my network is good, like dudes, you know, like this, but like nobody I could actually hire to do real work. Uh, whereas like my peers had come out of Facebook and Google and had these right. massive networks. So it took me a long time to, uh, to beef that up. And, if you, and, and, and having a great network that you can hire out of is really key in a growth business because, uh, you know, depending on, on cold calls is brutal. <laughs> yeah, I would wait, make a comment also just to reiterate that at the lower levels, uh, you know, in terms of hiring engineers, brand, and marketing managers, et cetera, I think we're kind of at a disadvantage because our networks are, are pretty stale there. Also, what we're really good at as, as investors is evaluating people through the network around them these people that are coming in with one or two years of experience don't really have anyone that we know. You, know, you look on LinkedIn, it's like, oh, I don't know anyone that knows them. So you're at a disadvantage in making that, uh, that call. One of the things that helped me make the leap was um, I reconnected with a couple of people that worked for me back at Disney. One was my CTO, one was my chief product officer. And it just coincidentally worked out mid-year 2014. They were looking to do something new as well. So I had a nucleus of a team that I had already worked with on and off for 15, 20 years, and that really made it a lot more comfortable. Yeah, uh, we have a couple minutes left, and there's two things that we use the word, and I hadn't thought about it, the word stale. Um, we, I was joking, but thinking about how if I had to do a PowerPoint or a keynote or a large Excel, my pivot table skills are not what they once were. Um, and the same, and Raj, your point about, I could tell you who the CMOs or COs were, but I couldn't tell you that level. You have like a five year age gap where you kind of know, and like that's a, big, that's a big change. And did you have to bring in certain people to really help you do that? Um, and so I think if you have a comment, and then lastly, what's, what's the insight? So you've been on both sides of the table. It's also the, the name of uh, my partner's blog, and I think that's what made this kind of a fun and quirky panel. But now that you've seen both sides, I'm not saying which side's better, but are there insights that if I only knew this on one side or if I only knew this on the other, what those might be? I think you know, we'll go around and kind of close from there, but I think that would be a good place. Um, so first question about being stale. Um, uh, one of the things that we did, and I have much like you were saying, you go through your first iteration of people. I think that happens a lot in startups where the first group of folks that you hire aren't always the people that can scale the business. Um, in the second iteration, we, were, we figured out that we needed to hire a lot of um, late 20s, early 30s um, who had brought, had, this might have been their second role, and they brought their own network with them, and that has proven to be a good thing for us to have done. I think that the risk of us is that you build a top-heavy organization, right? And that's mm -hmm. the antithesis of sort of what you need in the early stages. The flip side of that is when your business starts scaling, um, usually you find out later than you need to that you need to have more of those people. So it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's never a good answer. Um, uh, what, what, the second one was what would... Uh, what's the insight? What's the insight? Uh, both things are super hard. Um, and, um, you know, somebody said, you know, what's it take to be a great investor? First of all, I don't know great investor. I think it's impo It's a very, very hard job, period. Um, and I think that being an operator is a super, super hard job. Um, I think they're just different. And I think that the insight is kind of knowing what thing floats your boat uh, and, and, and kind of living in that zone. Okay. Mark? Um, in terms of the insight, if I was uh, going to go back to investing, I'd probably be pretty, uh, I'd be much more ruthless about my time allocation. Like I would spend time with probably fewer companies, leave myself more free time. Um, I think farting around on the internet and with products is like critical to succeeding in, uh, in the consumer product space, consumer interactive. And, uh, it's easy to not do it. Uh, but uh, leaving yourself 
you know, five, 10, 15 hours a week to play uh, is pretty key. Um, and also your time is just probably not well spent with some significant portion of meetings that you do for social reasons. Panels, and large groups. No, no, no. <laughs> I do more panels. Um, yeah, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, when I was a first-time entrepreneur, you always wonder, like, okay, how important really is venture capital? Does capital matter that much? If I have a great idea, everyone's going to come. And, and you really appreciate both doing venture and then being an operator, how um, capital can really help on speed. And speed is a really important thing now that I've realized being, doing it the second time. Um, things have moved much faster, like 3 to 4x faster than when I did my company in 1999 in doing that. And... Capital can help you really move fast in doing that. Richard, close us out. Yeah, so uh, I, the thing I would say is it's great to have a balance and experience in both. I think it help, each helps the other. So um, that would be sort of the, the final insight, I would say. But it, I would go back to I think you're predominantly good at one thing or another, and they're very different at the end of the day. So each person has to find what really is their passion and what's driving their soul, and that's where they should be spending their time. Great. Richard, Raj, Mark, Abe, it's an awesome panel. It was great. Thank you for your time, Thank and you. Uh, Thank thanks you. for coming down. Good to see you. Good to meet you.